Yesterday, officials from the Homeland Security and State Departments testified on implementation of new immigration policies known as the U.S. Visit Program. This House Government Reform Committee hearing is about an hour and 40 minutes. Good afternoon. The quorum being present, uh, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order. We meet uh, today to look into the implementation of the U.S. Visit Program by the Department of Homeland Security. U.S. Visit stands for the U.S. Visitor and Immigrate Immigrant Status Indicator Technology Program. When completed, the program will track the entry and exit of most non-immigrant visa holders who enter the United States. At the outset, it's important to acknowledge the scope of this undertaking. In 2003, there were over 427 million inspections at U.S. ports of entry. Of these inspections, 62 percent involve people from other countries. There are over 300 land, air, and sea ports of entry in the United States, from Dulles International Airport to the land crossing at Del Rio, Texas. The vast majority of these inspections, 79 percent, take place at land border crossings. Unfortunately, it is at these crossings where the constraints of space and time combine to place a potentially dangerous burden on legitimate travelers to the United States. Even though only 18 percent of all travelers seek entry at airports, the interrelated nature of our domestic hub system creates special problems for airports as well. At the same time, the implementation of U.S. visit thus far has not resulted in significant waiting time increases for the traveling public. Although these efforts have achieved some success and government agencies are enthusiastically looking for feedback and improving technology and management methods, U.S. Visit faces immense challenges as additional counselor posts, land border crossing points, and exit points begin to collect biometric data. Some would say the risks associated with these challenges suggest that this sort of nationwide integrated reform of our border control system is too ambitious. But those people underestimate the damage even one more terrorist event like September 11th could cause to our nation. People want to do business here because we provide a safe and stable commercial environment. Providing and maintaining this environment is one of the most important things that this government can do. Having said that, there are legitimate questions Congress should ask about the planning and acquisition implementation of U.S. visit. First, we would like an update on the effects of the increment one implementation for entry at airports to date. Second, it would be helpful to have a brief description of the acquisition strategy you have put in place, and it would be helpful to understand how DHS and the Department of State are working together to create an integrated visa issuance and border verification system that leverages all of the information gained at both consulate and border. This committee is also interested in how both DHS and the State Department are reaching out to domestic and foreign stakeholders. Is DHS applying the lessons learned from the TSA baggage screening implementation? Is it plans for the exit functions for the U.S. visit program? How are DHS and State informing and educating the foreign business community about U.S. visit? The multitude of questions surrounding this implementation creates a nexus of issues that the Committee on Government Reform is uniquely positioned to discuss. The need for the various related agencies involved to not only cooperate but to allow their internal databases to talk to each other on a minute-by-minute -minute basis worldwide marks a new standard for interagency collaboration. The effort to use next-generation technologies in a real-world environment is both laudable and worthy of study. Can DHS institute a system that works today and will be flexible to change in the coming years? Is DHS's acquisition plan and schedule reasonable and realistic? Can government affect the nationwide integration while truly exploring and identifying the best solution possible? As the Nation anticipates the next phase of DHS's U.S. visit program, we need to recognize that this new system is being implemented in a time when this nation faces a continuing terrorist threat. Today's terrorists have decided to engage in asymmetrical warfare by attacking our people and institutions instead of our military. Simply following the old best practices model will not provide an effective defense of our homeland. As a Congress, we have to give our most talented Federal employees the authority to tear down stovepipes and create a flexible, scalable solution for tracking activity at our Nation's borders. This is a monumental task and there is no room for error. We welcome today the Honorable Asa Hutchison from the Department of Homeland Security and the Honorable Maura Hardy from the Department of State. We also have a second panel, which I will introduce later. We believe all of these witnesses will provide the committee with a diverse set of opinions and viewpoints, and I very much look forward to today's hearing. I now yield to any other members who wish to make uh, opening uh, statements. Uh, gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton. Uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, uh, I appreciate uh, this hearing, and I'm going to try to stay as long as I can, probably not the entire time. I do want to 
say that uh, on my way to Guantanamo this weekend, this past weekend, we stopped in Miami and had the U.S. visited, visit uh, demonstrated to us. At one level, it's very impressive with you putting your finger uh, up and then a bunch of, of data is, is retrieved. Um, we also saw foreign visitors who seem to be getting through fairly quickly. Uh, we noted, though, that we weren't at the height of the season when these foreign visitors come. The time it took was more than uh, was was uh, was well, than we were told it would. But nevertheless, when you see all the information come up quickly, uh, it it encouraged us. The at the same time, um, obviously. It's the first time we have um, uh, done this kind of uh, intrusive investigation of people as they come in. Uh, the first thing I, that, that crossed my mind was that there would be visitors, particularly from Latin America or from Europe, who would find an easier way to get where they wanted to get. Many of our visitors trans uh, come through the United States. Um, and I, I was concerned about that. I, my, my other concern would be whether we are going to make uh, at the ports what, what, we've ha what we now have at the airports. Uh, we haven't found a way to get around the long lines. We know it's necessary uh, to look closely at people and at their luggage and everything they're car carrying with them. Uh, we know that perhaps technology will get us to the point where that is done more efficiently and more quickly. Now that we're doing an analog of that at the ports, I think we have to be mindful of the concerns we've had in domestic uh, air flight, airline, uh, in, in our domestic airlines, and particularly when foreign visitors who may be precisely the kind of visitors we want to come to this country with revenue from abroad leaving here uh, who may decide that we make it so difficult that uh, there are other ways to get where they're going besides the United States. At the same time, I'm the first to say that these folks coming from abroad are the ones we want to uh, look at more closely, so I don't envy those who have to come up with a system that both keeps us secure and makes sure that our uh, enviable uh, tourism and commerce proceeds as before. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Any other members wish to make statements? If not, we'll proceed to our first uh, panel. And uh, as you know, it's the rules of the committee. I have to swear you in. And Asa, let me just say welcome back to this committee. Uh, I'll tell you, I feel a lot better about the reorganization at DHS. So uh, Governor Ridge and having you there, uh, we're very proud of the job you're doing there. So welcome back. Ms. Hardy, thank you for being with us as well. Please raise your right hands. You promise the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll start with you, and uh, again, welcome back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is good to uh, be with you and uh, the remaining other members of the committee. Thank you for your leadership and partnership in this important effort. U.S. visit represents the greatest advance in border technology in three decades. It is a historic achievement in which we, for the first time in history, can use a biometric ability to confirm the identity of those traveling to our country with visas. The Department of Homeland Security deployed the first increment of U.S. visit on time, within budget, and has exceeded the mandate established by Congress. We also met the challenge that was given to us by Secretary Ridge to include biometrics ahead of schedule. But what U.S. visit also delivers is the ability to have security without sacrificing the flow of legitimate travel uh, through our borders. U.S. visit Entry uh, procedures are currently deployed at 115 airports and 14 seaports. As of today, almost 2 million foreign visitors have been processed under the new U.S. visit entry procedures with no measurable increase in wait times. And even more importantly, we have prevented over 60 criminals from entering the country. Without the biometric capabilities U.S. visit delivers, we would not have caught these people. We are currently meeting the deadline for exit as well. Our exit procedures are based upon passenger departure information shared with us by carriers. We match this information with the visa information, and this allows us to identify visa overstays. 
We currently have, let me emphasize, the biographic data that will allow us to determine visa overstays. We want to be able to enhance this with the biometric feature, and we are testing this with various pilots, one of them being at the Baltimore Washington International Airport. Now, I think there is a uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation, but uh, I want to explain how uh, U.S. visit works. The biographic and biometric information are collected overseas at the visa issuing post and then verified at the port of entry. And from the standpoint of uh, Customs and Border Protection, the example I'm using is a visitor who has had their finger scan and digital photo taken at an overseas post. The visitor arrives at the inspection booth and provides their travel documents, passport and visa to the officer. The officer swipes the machine readable part of the visa. The system immediately selects the correct file from the State Department's database to display. And this information is seen on the officer's monitor. The officer asks the visitor to place first their left index finger and then their right index finger on the finger scanner device that captures their finger scans. The officer then takes a digital photograph of the visitor. While the officer continues the entry questioning, the finger scans are compared against a criminal and terrorist watch list, and the biographic and biometric data are matched against the data captured by the State Department. This ensures that the person entering the country is the same person who received a visa. In addition, the digital picture that was taken of the visitor at the visa issuing post is displayed on the inspector screen for visual comparison. And of course, the biometric check-in is only a tool that the officer uses to determine admissibility, not the entire process. And this biometric check through the select watch list takes a matter of seconds. When the system has completed its check, the officer sees a response that says either no hit or hit. If a no hit is received, the officer completes the interview, updates the screen, with the duration of the visitor's stay, and unless other questions arise, welcomes the visitor into the United States. The addition of biometrics collected abroad and verified at the port of entry is one of the many tools that Customs Border Protection officers use to make their decision to admit a visitor into the country. Mr. Chairman, since the U.S. visit entry procedures were implemented, we have caught a fugitive who escaped from prison 20 years ago. We have caught and extradited a felon wanted for manslaughter. We stopped a drug dealer who had entered our country more than 60 times in the past four years using different names and dates of birth. And just this Monday, a woman attempted to enter through Puerto Rico, and though there was a lookout for her in the interagency border inspection system, or IBIS, because she had a fairly common surname, her biographic information didn't give us a match. But the U.S. visit biometric check allowed officers to confirm that she was the same person wanted in New Jersey for possession of stolen property. The U.S. visit biometric match also tied her to an additional 17 aliases and seven different dates of birth. Her criminal history dates back to 1994, includes multiple arrests in New York for larceny, Maryland for theft, and arrests in New Jersey. I don't think I've covered all the states yet, but it was a very significant arrest record. She, of course, has been deported to the United States uh, in 1998 and now is uh, waiting extradition. It is important to note that this serves as a deterrent as the word goes out that we have this capability. Another huge uh, compliment, uh, accomplishment is that we have uh, published a privacy policy and privacy impact statement. And we have, in response to the question, worked very closely with the State Department. I want to compliment uh, my partner, uh, Maura Hardy, uh, Assistant Secretary at State, who has done such an outstanding jo job in developing uh, this program in partnership with us. We also have worked with the airlines and the airports and those in the private sector. But our job is not finished. We have submitted the 04 spin plan and has been expressed. One of the concerns is what are we going to do for the land borders? U.S. visit will apply to visitors with visa crossing, with visas crossing our land borders just like our air and seaports. What is different from our air and seaports is that on the land borders, the U.S. visit process of finger scanning and digital photo will be taken at the secondary inspection area and not primary. This is where visitors with visas go today, so this is not a change. What is new is that our visitors will have their identity verified using U.S. visit procedures, and this process will add up to less than 15 seconds to the overall secondary inspection. 
Again, the current process is for visitors with visas to go immediately to secondary inspection. So U.S. visit is not taking or adding any time to the primary process. Our remaining issue is the 104 million Mexican citizens that are holder of border cr crossing cards. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, on the uh, chart that's over here, you can see the breakdown uh, by volume of those that are crossing our land borders. The U.S. citizens, legal permanent residents, visas exempt, visa waiver, regular visas, and the Mexican border crossing cards of 104 million, totaling 440 million that come across our land borders. Uh, we have not made any final decisions in this regard uh, on the border crossing cards, but obviously this presents a unique challenge to us that we will have to have to address. We also intend to look at radio frequency or RF technology to aid in the processing of visitors across the land borders at the 50 busiest ports of entry and exit. We're optimistic that we can develop a procedure at our land borders that is just as accommodating and facilitating as that what we have done at our uh, air and seaports as well. I want to thank again this committee for their partnership in this endeavor. I look forward to answering questions. We're committed to uh, building this system that adds to our system, that adds to our security, and ultimately will help us to facilitate those legitimate travelers into our country. Thank you very much. Ms. Hardy. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you very much for inviting me to testify before you today on the role of the Bureau of Consular Affairs in implementing biometrics programs in U.S. visas and in passports. The inclusion of biometrics in international travel documents is an important step in enhancing our nation, the security of our nation's borders. The Department of State's visa work abroad constitutes a vital element in providing for our national border security. The consular officers of the Foreign Service who adjudicate visas at our embassies and consulates abroad are truly our first line of defense. Through them, our goal is to push the very borders of the United States out as far from our nation's shores as possible to stop a problematic or a questionable traveler well before they reach our country. The Border Security Act requires that no later than October 26th of this year, the Secretary of State issued to aliens only visas that use biometric identifiers. To comply with this requirement, the State Department began deployment of the biometric visa program last September. I'm pleased to report that more than 80 posts are currently enrolling fingerprints, and the program will be in effect at all 212 visa adjudicating posts by the October 26 deadline. Under State's biometric visa program, our consular officers by October of 04 will enroll applicants' fingerprints with electronic scanners as part of the visa application process. The scanner looks like this. I'd like to call to your attention several slides that I've got as well, which demonstrate how we work in concert with our colleagues at DHS in seven pilot posts uh, and how it will work in the future all around the world. As we see in slide one, the officer reviews uh, biographic address and contact information for the applicant along with other uh, uh, specific application data. I should note that this is only a small part of the information that is available to an officer during the process. The second slide demonstrates, and I realize it's much harder to see than the copy I've got in front of me, but the second slide demonstrates how the officer marries up the applicant's photo with the, bio, with the fingerprint biometric identifier he or she just in fact collected. I think we're a little bit uh, out of order here. Uh, but the second slide in my presentation has both the photo and the fingerprints side by side. So one is matched against the other. In the third slide, that's the second slide. In the third slide, which we just saw, the officer reviews the ident check conducted on the applicant. In the case of this applicant at this time, there is no response from the ident record. That means there is no print at all available through the ident uh, database. The fourth slide is what the consular officer sees upon receipt of the results of the class name check for the applicant. In this example, there is a previous refusal under the same name. The officer will now need to further examine this case to determine, to determine if the refusal actually pertains to the applicant in front of them or if it is in fact simply someone with a similar or the same name. At this point in the process, there are naturally two ways to go. If the officer decides to issue a visa, our non-immigrant visa system sends the issued visa data, including the applicant's photo, to DHS. The fifth and final slide is the data ports of entries currently see. It looks quite, quite a bit like the uh, first 
slide that Undersecretary Hutchinson showed you. In the future, when a visa applicant arrives at a port of entry, the U.S. visit system will use the fingerprint identification number to match the visa with the file in IDENT and compare the visa holder's fingerprints with those on file. This one-to-one -one photo and fingerprint comparison will ensure that the person presenting the visa at the port of entry is the same person to whom the visa was issued abroad. If the applicant's fingerprints match fingerprints provided by the FBI in the IDENT Lookout database, we will not issue a visa until a consular officer reviews the information regarding that individual. The point I'd really like to underscore here is that an IDENT hit overseas will freeze the visa process until that hit is resolved. We're currently piloting the IDENT match program at seven overseas posts, and we will continue to add new posts as quickly as possible to meet that October deadline. The Border Security Act also established October 2604 as the date by which visa waiver program countries must issue to their nationals only machine-readable passports incorporating biometric identifiers that comply with the standards established by ICAO. ICAO's decision to make facial recognition technology the standard passport biometric was made in May of 2003, leaving VWP countries approximately 17 months to bring a biometric passport from design to production a process that normally takes several years. Although VWP country governments share a commitment to making this change and all are to varying degrees making progress toward complying with the requirement, virtually all visa waiver countries have indicated they will be unable to meet the deadline. The legislative requirements of the Border Security Act, which I just described, apply only to passports issued by visa waiver program countries, not the U.S. passport, which I firmly believe is the most valuable travel document on the planet. Although our law does not require of us what it requires of the VWP countries, we nevertheless have a program that will produce the first biometric U.S. passports using ICAO's standard of facial recognition by October of this year. We hope to complete the transition to biometric passports by the end of 2005. The Department of State is working hand-in-hand -hand with our colleagues and friends at the Department of Homeland Security to ensure that we together have a system that facilitates legitimate international travel and properly identifies those who pose a threat to present, prevent them from entering the country. Our continued commitment to ensuring the sanctity and security of our borders and our nation is our number one priority. I'd like to thank Undersecretary Hutchinson and his team for the very collaborative effort we have, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have this afternoon. Thank you very much. Ms. Harney, let me start with you. Um, uh, many delays in obtaining visas have a profound effect, obviously, on business and educational institutions here in the, in, in the uh, U.S. Members of the committee staff recently visited China and learned about the Beijing Embassy's proposal for a one-year multi-entry visa for Chinese visitors. Uh, can you tell me about the status of this proposal? Any estimate uh, is when the decision might be made? Sure, absolutely, and I thank you for the question, sir. Uh, I think it's a good suggestion, and we one of the many changes in the post-September 11th world is that we have a much more collaborative interagency process on just such decisions. Uh, we received a cable from the Post spelling out what they'd like to do. We applaud it. We're running it through the interagency process now, and I think it's fair to say we'll have an answer very quickly. I agree with you completely that uh, facilitating legitimate travel is important to all of us, and we'd like to see that done. Also, Ms. Hardy, uh, I understand it's October 26, 2004 is the implementation date uh, for biometric-enabled travel documents for visa waiver countries, yes, as sir. well as uh, U.S. intelligent passport system. It's going to be difficult to meet it. Any idea at this point as to whether that deadline will need to be extended? Uh, sir, what I can say about that is that uh, it's a frightening prospect. Uh, if the visa waiver countries uh, are held to the deadline as the law currently requires, uh, several things will happen. My job is to implement the law, and so I will do that. However, one of the consequences of so doing is that we will have an awful lot more visa applicants to, to converse with than we have had in the recent past. We estimate that there may be upwards of five and a half to eight million additional visa applications that we would have to handle. Of course, sir, it's a relatively short-term problem as the visa waiver countries uh, begin to come on board with their biometrically enabled passport. But in the short term, sir, we would see a, a serious impact on business travel, on, on academic institutions, on travel and tourism to this country. Uh, we will do our very best to facilitate the travel of those who are in an emergency situation, those who have time-sensitive travel. 
but there will be a serious impact on the uh, on the visa waiver countries and on our abilities to provide services to them in the short term. Okay, thanks. Hey, so last year um, the GAO issued a report that characterized the U.S. visit program as a high-risk endeavor. Uh, but the report was issued at a time when U.S. Visit uh, Office was still in the process of staffing and setting up the office. I know you are aware of the report. Um, in the five months since that report was issued, uh, can you give us an update on how the concerns that were laid out have been addressed? Absolutely. And uh, the GAO report was really understandable because uh, it is a risky endeavor when you are talking about $330 million of the taxpayers' money in a complicated system. Uh, but uh, I th uh, a couple of specific issues that they raised. One was the, uh, uh, the uh, very beginning stage of the program office that was not fully developed that would provide oversight. And uh, Jim Williams uh, is with me, who is the director of the program office, uh, brings an extraordinary amount of expertise. He has set up a team, established an office. Uh, they are very robust and, and are moving forward very aggressively. So I think that concern has been met. The second one was that there was not uh, any uh, broad-based uh, oversight in terms of uh, the different agencies that might be impacted. That has been set up. I'm chairman of an advisory board, and uh, we have met, and so that interagency oversight has been uh, met as well. Uh, do you think the deadlines for U.S. visit uh, allow for enough time for implementation, or do you think uh, you'll be asking for extensions, or is it just too early to say? I, I believe that uh, uh, that's something we need to continue our discussions with Congress on. Some of it is uh, how uh, robust the interpretations of the requirements are and the expectations of Congress. Uh, the 04 spend plan that we've presented, we can meet the uh, 04 deadline of integrating uh, the databases at the 50 busiest ports. And then if you look at the 05 solution, some of it will be uh, you know, the funding, how quickly we can move toward our solution. So <coughs> I'm optimistic that we can meet those deadlines that Congress has given to us, but we would certainly welcome a continued discussion with you uh, and a partnership with you to make sure that we're going in the same direction. Okay. Thank you. The gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, you made a, a passing comment about the Mexican um, border crossing card. Uh, so let me follow up on that if I could. Uh, what was the original intention of the administration with respect to the Mexican uh, border crossing card? Well, I don't know that there was, uh, an, an, our intent was, is to fully satisfy the requirements of the congressional mandate for an entry exit system and to build a, a strong, robust system there. Uh, so it's a matter of designing it. There has not been any change in position. It's a matter of developing the right process to handle those border crossing cards. Okay, well, maybe I, I need to phrase it differently. Then what do you, is it you expect the card to do exactly? Thank you. Uh, well, the, the card, of course, there's 104 million of them already issued out there. They are used uh, for frequent border crossers. They have fingerprints. They have a background check uh, to a certain extent before those cards are issued. Uh, the question is or whether we're going to take their biometric when they come in. Obviously, that's difficult time-wise when you're talking about 104 million of them. So we're looking at the right way to be able to track that, uh, looking at radio frequency technology. One consideration is, but no decision is made, but one consideration is that they should simply be uh, uh, processed through but not entered into U.S. visit. Uh, and obviously, that's uh, a logical thing to consider because of the volume and the time it would take and potential for clogging our borders if you did try to enroll biometrically all of the border crossing cards. So we're still looking at that, uh, the possibility of exempting them from the U.S. visit enrollment requirement when it's used as a crossing card. Now if it's used as a regular long-term visa, like a B-1 visa, then they would go into secondary inspection and they would be enrolled in U.S. visit. Uh, and so that is uh, what we're, we're looking at, but again, no final decision has been made. Okay. And, and where are you, in the, are you? Are you slowing down your process on that or delaying it a little bit here? Or are you? No, absolutely not. Uh, we're uh, on schedule in this regard, and we expect a final decision to be made very quickly because we know it's a great concern to the border communities, particularly looking at what's ahead. They need to know. So we anticipate 
a decision very shortly. Okay, so you have no change in this process or no new news that you want to give us with respect to this border crossing card? Uh, not other than they're working very hard on that and hope to be able to make a final decision uh, fairly soon. So in a day or two, we don't expect any news on that issue from the administration? I uh, would uh, not necessarily count on that. Uh, it's, we're, we're obviously, whenever you're making a very substantial policy change, or cha not change necessarily, but uh, determining the direction as to handle how to handle this that impacts so many communities, you've got to check with a lot in the interagency community, work with Congress on that, and that's the process that we're going through right now. And what's your current recommendation with regard to it? My current recommendation? My recommendation would be that the border crossing cards, when they're used as uh, the 72-hour uh, uh, permit, then they should be exempt from the enrollment in U.S. visit. That would be my current uh, uh, opinion. Uh, and then whenever they're used as a regular visa, they should be referred to secondary inspection for enrollment in U.S. visit. And what risk do we run on our security with respect to exempting it uh, on, on that shorter period of time? Well, if you continue to uh, uh, handle the border crossing cards as they do now, uh, you're not running any additional risk. You're simply not adding uh, the significant security capabilities by having a biometric confirmation. Now, as we proceed and develop the U.S. visit program more uh, broadly and, and comprehensively, uh, we want to bring the border crossing cards completely into U.S. visit in the right way. Uh, but it might be, again, radio frequency technology where you'd have an embedded chip uh, in the card uh, that uh, would be waived just like an easy pass to a reader, uh, and that would come up for the inspector, and that way you could travel up to 40 miles per hour. I wouldn't suggest that going through our ports of entry, but the technology is capable of reading uh, those type of uh, cards through radio frequency technology even at that speed. So I'm sort of struck. If you're going to exempt a class of people there, you're going to exempt a good number of countries uh, that are listed, everything from Andorra to Switzerland. Is that to say that there, there's no potential that anybody is going to have anybody from any one of those countries be involved with terrorism? They don't need to be checked, but every other uh, country needs to be checked. I don't, I don't get the, how that enhances our security or how it doesn't leave gaping holes. Well, uh, first of all, this is a system that uh, is not a perfect system on day one. You have phase one, phase two, phase three. Those are the directions that Congress gave us. And so it's not going to be a perfect security system on day one. We build on it. Uh, secondly, the border crossing cards, you already have their fingerprint. You already have their check. They're not issued that car unless we're satisfied they're not a terrorist. And so these frequent crossers are coming across for economic interest. So we're not uh, creating any security vulnerability by, uh, if we make the decision to exempt those. Uh, in reference to other countries such as visa waiver, uh, that is uh, obviously something, again, that we continue to uh, look at, but on the day one of our system, uh, we're adding, uh, what is it, 36 million uh, travelers into our airports and seaports. That's a pretty big, pretty big first mouthful. Uh, and then we see how this needs to be expanded to cover other security gaps. I have more questions, but I'll wait, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Gentleman from uh, Virginia is recognized for five minutes. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me thank both of you for testifying and, and for those who will. Let me make a brief statement that I have a couple questions, and I'm sorry I was late. Uh, clearly, today's testimony is going to be very beneficial to us in Congress and those, for this, those of us charged with oversight of this incredibly important issue. The task set before all of us to protect our borders and national interests while preventing unnecessary delays to our flow of commerce trade and tourism is, is clearly an, uh, a daunting task. The efforts to date by all those involved in the guidance and direction of the DHS is clearly to be commended. I realize the visit program is in its infancy and expect we will see it change and conform in due time as we realize future benefits from the lessons we have learned through its implementation. And I'm convinced <clears throat> that the American people and the tourist population uh, will remain security minded and we will be tolerant and patient as we experience growing pains, as long as we maintain a focus on efficiency and effectiveness and never become complacent with this program. I say tolerant because I have gone through several airports in the last week, and I really was, and I was really surprised myself. 
I have a very deep concern and a personal stake in these efforts because the district I represent in Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach and Norfolk uh, has one of the largest commercial seaports, incredible military facilities and major tourist attractions and an international airport. So I tell you I pledge my support to whatever is necessary to provide maximum security for our ports and borders, ports being my number one issue right now, while minimizing the obstacles to the reasonable flow of tourists and trade at our ports. And I thank you for what you're doing. We understand that the statutory requirements uh, have placed officer, DHS officers in Riyadh and Jeddah, where I have spent a lot of time, uh, to review visa adjudications and the more officers are coming. What value are these officers going to have uh, to the visa adjudication process? Those uh, visa security officers were deployed to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia in accordance with a mandate that uh, Congress gave us, the Homeland Security Act. The value that they add, and, and uh, Congressman, I was uh, there as well to see the kind of work that they do, uh, they uh, review every uh, visa application in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they check directly with uh, the uh, law enforcement databases, uh, add a security perspective, and I think that is the specific value that the Homeland Security visa security officers would add is a security perspective to that issuance process. They're also engaged in uh, uh, training, uh, you know, coordination there on the ground, uh, making recommendations on uh, any uh, policy changes that need to be made. Uh, as time goes on, I think their role will change somewhat. Uh, Moore and I have talked that uh, eventually the consular offices should have access to all the databases that we check so they can do all the checks there and then our visa security officers can uh, look to having uh, more liaison with the law enforcement community there, adding intelligence value on the ground. you have enough of them there? Uh, we have enough there uh, at the present time. The problem is that a number of them are there TDY, uh, and we're going to have to get permanent deployment there, but we do have at the present time sufficient. Secretary Hardy? Thank you, sir. I agree with Under Secretary Hutchinson completely in what he just said. Uh, I would like to add that I also have been there, and our colleagues uh, at both state and DHS are working very well together. We do look forward to the time when, and we are working very, very carefully and assiduously on data share issues so that we can free up people from, uh, from doing repetitive tasks. If our systems talk to each other completely, they would be freed up uh, on the Homeland Security side to do a little bit more liaison, a little bit more intelligence work, and that will um, greatly enhance the level of play for, bo for both teams, for one team and for both, uh, both sets of things that need to be done. Great. Uh, I fear that uh, we could be setting ourselves up for failure if the basics, such as the data line, the baseline database uh, are not among our first priorities. And uh, I know the uh, law enforcement information exchange program that is being piloted both in the district I represent and, the north, and in the Northwest is, is one such uh, effort. Uh, are we seeing uh, some nationally implemented efforts like this to share criminal information and build greater databases? The concern I had uh, right after 9-11 was that we had 47 federal agencies doing intelligence and you wouldn't talk to me. and. Uh, you wouldn't talk to him and I wouldn't talk to anybody because we were giving up power and I'm just wondering if that's all coming together. Uh, it is. That's probably as high a priority as we have in the department uh, is uh, just to address the problem that you uh, uh, outlined. And uh, both U.S. Visit and our uh, visa security officers I think are emblematic of some success in this area, particularly U.S. Visit where we have uh, brought together the databases so that our inspectors at the uh, entry points will have the same information that our consular officers will have uh, and that uh, it will be almost an instantaneous transfer. We continue to build upon that. Uh, I will add that, uh, you know, the, uh, what we'll bring in with the private sector contractor, the integrator of the U.S. visit. What they will do will help us to modernize and to integrate all of the different databases. And uh, that contract will go out this year. Uh, last year, the President asked for $400 million, and our U.S. visit was funded, I think, at $330 million. And, you know, that difference makes a uh, uh, substantial impact on what we can do in that area. Yeah. Secretary? Sir, I agree completely again with Undersecretary Hutchinson. Uh, we really 
have, he, he mentioned Jim Williams' name already. We have a great partner and a great friend at State and Jim Williams, and uh, we have done a lot together already. Just a little bit earlier during uh, my opening remarks, I uh, showed several slides that already show uh, that when a consular officer, say, issues a visa this morning, or issued one this morning, say, in Buenos Aires, within five minutes' time, the, consolid the consular consolidated database refreshes itself and shares that information with inspectors at ports of entry, so that when that Argentine citizen travels to the United States, even the same day, the inspector at the port of entry already has the photo and access to the same biographic information that we saw at the consular post overseas. That's a tremendous uh, ability to spot and make sure that we don't see people engaged in photo substitution of passports. Right. It's a tremendous ability to, for the inspector at a port of entry to know what we knew and to ask the appropriate questions to make sure there isn't a gap there. And that has happened since 9-11, that ability, I guess. I'm sorry, sir? That ability to do that has happened since 9-11? Uh, we introduced the the database ourselves in 1999, and we began rolling it out very, very slowly, regrettably, to, uh, uh, to legacy INS. Uh, post 9-11, that uh, you know, deployment speed increased rapidly, Great. very rapidly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Van Hollen. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, holding the hearing on this uh, important issue. Um, Secretary Hardy, I had a couple questions. As you st stated in your testimony, I think our, our consulates are sort of, they are the front line uh, in this effort of screening uh, people for visa purposes. And I think it's essential uh, that we have the, the, the right technology and information systems uh, in place so that we can compare, you know, ap visa applicants against databases that we've got uh, to determine whether they've got a criminal background record or, or any kind of profile that would lead us to be concerned of a potential terrorist activity. I think it's essential that the databases be coordinated so that we, we have common information and the most comprehensive information. Uh, my, my concern is really with, I, I represent an area right, right next to the nation's capital, a very diverse community. Um, and once someone passes that check, in other words, they've, they've passed the, the computer check that, that the counselor office, all the information has gone through, and they've confirmed that there is no match with the database, then the counselor officer still has to make a, a, a decision as to whether or not this person should be granted a non-immigrant visa. And um, my concern is in many cases there are people who have legitimate reasons to come to the United States, whether it's for education purposes, whether it's to visit a sick family member, dying family members in many cases, who are being denied uh, visas without being provided really any additional information as to why they don't meet the test. Right now, as I understand the test is, uh, the, the counselor officer uh, has to determine whether or not they have sufficient ties to their country that they live in, which is a very wide open test, and, and we want our consular officers to have discretion. On the other hand, it seems to me incumbent that we provide some of these people reasons that they're being denied. And again, these are people who have met the security check, okay? We've, we've confirmed that there was no match, um, because we've had literally now hundreds of cases, in many cases, people who want to visit dying relatives, who do have ties to their country of origin, have no reason to want to stay in this country, uh, but they are being denied uh, on a routine basis. And I, I, my question is, and they have to pay $100 every time, at least, something thereabouts. And, and many times they pay, they've paid $100 more than once, and they're not really given, in many cases, reasons by the, the counselor officers as to why they're being denied. So it makes it much more difficult for us to help them provide the information. How, how can we uh, address those issues? I mean, I've got lots of cases here, which I think any who is looking at the facts would conclude that this person wanted to come to the United States for legitimate reasons, uh, and yet they were denied a visa. So that's one. And then I have questions on the other end. It seems to me we're not doing, we need to do more for people who are actually overstaying their visas. But if you could address that first. Sure. I, I thank you very much for the question. It uh, goes to the very heart of what we do. I, I agree with you completely. And uh, with Secretary Powell, who talks very, very regularly about the uh, importance of balancing secure borders and open doors, and the importance on the open doors side of that equation of recognizing that this country prospers in countless numbers of ways when we, in fact, allow uh, legitimate travelers to come here, be they coming for tourism, business travel, academic uh, pursuits, or any other personal reason. We need to bear in mind the travel and tourism industry, an $88 billion industry, one out of every seven civilian adults employed in this country is employed by some facet of the travel and tourism industry. We're not 
unaware of those things. What we are aware of as we do our jobs as consular officers overseas, as I have done for many years myself, um, is the great privilege of representing our country overseas and, in fact, of being able to delve into the society in, to which we have been assigned so that we speak the language. We read the newspapers. We understand the economics. We understand very well from our friends in the Department of Homeland Security the overstay rate uh, of people from the country that we are assigned to. We do a balance that allows us to take into account everything we know about that country and then ask very specific in individual questions to the person in front of us. It's awfully sad sometimes, sir, you're absolutely right. If someone comes up and says that they have a dying relative, the, the last thing in the world we want to do is impose an additional hardship on them. Having said that, though, um, uh, sometimes it, it isn't all always exactly what it seems to be, both on the side of what the applicant might tell us about why they're coming, as well as uh, when the applicant says they weren't necessarily told what the answer or the reason for their denial was. Um, in a country, say, with a 47 percent unemployment rate, a young applicant who wants to go to the United States, who doesn't have a job in his own country, doesn't necessarily look to us like somebody who would come home again when they might, in fact, seek right. employment. Right. I, I don't States. mean to interrupt you, but my time is going to expire soon, and I, I just need to. I, cl clearly, the individual that you were just describing is somebody who you can understand why someone would make a judgment that maybe they would be a risk to stay in the United States. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go over the all cases. Maybe we can go over them some individually. Sure. But I'm, we're talking about a, a, someone from India, a woman who's a member of the All Indian University Badminton Champion, 1991. She was admitted to George Washington University School of Business and Public Management. Uh, she wants to come here for the, she was admitted to the special program. Her father's to ag agreed to pay for her entire stay in the United States. The family's got lots of assets in India. And there's no clear reason why this woman was denied. And I, you know, and I, maybe in some cases you're saying that they don't provide the individual with the reason, but sometimes our office asks for a reason mm -hmm. and we don't get an explanation. And so clearly there are many cases where people should, where their judgment is absolutely right, but it seems to me there's got to be a process. Uh, where, you know, in, in those cases where the, the facts suggest that there are good reasons to come here, I mean, I'm dying family members. I mean, when I talk to somebody who works at NIH who's, who's got a family member who's dying, who lives, who lives in the neighborhood, and I know, and they just want their brother who's 75 years old to come visit them mm -hmm. before they die, mm -hmm. uh, and they're denied a visa, it seems to me there's got to be a, a mechanism for dealing with this at the, at the staff to staff level rather than it having to get elevated up to a member of, of, of Congress intervening. And uh, my time's expired. Maybe there'll be another round. I mean, my concern is we're not focusing enough of our efforts on people who are overstaying their visas. I mean, we've got part of this visit program has this exit port provision, which right now is a voluntary program, I believe, at two airports, including VWI. Uh, really, we should be going after those people who are abusing uh, the visas by overstaying, we're giving a lot less attention to that, while at the same time it seems to me a lot of people who want to come here legitimately are being left out. Um, I guess my time's expired, but maybe I, I would like to pursue this because I, we really get lots of uh, cases, Mr. Chairman, and we, we don't pursue every one, uh, but we pursue, we, we want to pursue those that, we, that really the facts suggest that the individual is, is is not really been given full information as to why they've been denied entry. Well, we get the, a lot of the I same. I know you do. Uh, in our district. Yeah, Mr. Rufusberg. Sure. Okay. Well, watching. first, uh, uh, under Secretary Hutchison, former Congress member, um, I've heard nothing but complimentary feedback from Baltimore Washington International Airport. I represent Maryland's second congressional, congressional district, and BWI is in, uh, is in that district. Now, we did in the beginning uh, with the TSA, we had complaints that our office had to deal with involving long lines. And I think one of the reasons for that is that TSA had a good program, they cut the personnel and then all of a sudden the lines uh, increased, but we changed that. As it relates to this program, U.S. Visit Program, uh, I think one of the reasons it's working well, and, and I'm going to ask you some questions because you'll probably be gone, but the next panel under the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is on that panel. So I want you the opportunity to respond to what your experiences are, at least at BWI, which is what I, I know about. But I think that, that the uh, Department of Homeland Security and the BWI have been working very, very closely. And it has worked very well. It's a pilot program. And I think BWI is the only airport right now that has the exit, uh, exit procedures and kiosks. And there has been absolutely, and our office nor BWI have received no complaints at all about the program. 
which is incredible. Usually you get complaints about something somewhere. And I think one of the main reasons for this is that there's a program developed called U.S. Helpers. And these are individuals who are working in the international terminal to work with these individuals. Right. Because what they're tra really saying to the people when they're exiting, if you don't give us the information when you're leaving, you won't be able to come back again or whatever. And, and, that, and that is working. Um, I've heard, though, complaints about long lines interfering with business. Uh, business is extremely important. International business ex is extremely important to us. However, I would think that after 9-11 and based on what occurred and our threat against terrorism and our national security, that anyone coming into this country uh, will, as long as they're not in an amount of delays, that would have, wouldn't have a problem of giving a fingerprint and information off of, of their passport. I mean, we have to have, we have social security numbers and we have to have pictures on our driver's license. And, and it's so important for national security. And there's also a lot of waiver co uh, countries that aren't affected. And you're saying, well, is that fair? Well, bottom line, we have to rely on our t intelligence. And our intelligence shows that we can't take care of everybody, everything, but we have to set our priorities. Uh, so could you discuss, really, I'm asking you to answer the question. I anticipate that the chamber might be concerned about, about interfering with business. And that has not been the case at BWI Airport for whatever reason. So if it works, I think do it someplace else or use that as a model uh, when we implement this program on a national basis. Uh, thank you, Congressman. And I want to compliment uh, BWI. They've been a tremendous partner uh, in assisting us in testing the exit solution. And uh, we are very grateful for that. And you're right. We uh, made sure that we had uh, personnel that was present to help the foreign visitor to make sure they knew how to do it to assist them in that exit solution. And we'll be piloting that in other places. And I know that the Chamber and others uh, have expressed some concern about, uh, you know, whether we're moving too quickly, how this is going to impact business, particularly in the land borders. And uh, I appreciate uh, and uh, understand their concerns. In fact, we look forward to meeting with them regularly on this. But first of all, uh, the history should help a little bit that we haven't th those fears were there in reference to the airport solution and they didn't materialize because we were committed to make sure we didn't clog business and we added that security value we have the same commitment for the land borders we want to work with those communities and continue to work with the chamber who've been a very very good partner what is very very important is that where there's bwi airport that we have a communication with them all the airports the airlines that are impacted and now it is the communities at our land borders that we need to listen to. Jim Williams will be going down there next week and listening to them. We're going to have that same kind of dialogue and partnership as we go to uh, phase two of U.S. visit as we did at do the we, airports. Do we, uh, do we have helpers? Are we going to use those helpers at other airports, the same system? Uh, whenever there's a similar solution, we will. And we hope it'll be a temporary thing until all of our travelers get okay. used to the requirements. But initially, I see, yes. I see my time is getting close, and I've, we've got a strict chairman here today, so I uh, want to ask you this one question, because this is uh, where I have received a lot of complaints and asking your opinion, only your opinion on this. I know that with respect to terrorists and al-Qaeda, that we have to always give different looks as far as security. Um, and because al-Qaeda is very patient, and they do do surveillance. There's no question. We, we know that and have established that. Uh, at BWI Airport, uh, there is a program to when at least we went to code orange to auto, to one day just stop all cars that are coming to the airport now i guarantee you that many people will miss their flights because of that issue i'm wondering whether in your opinion whether or not that type of tactic uh and that is worth the result to really delay and to stop everybody coming into bw airport without notice i know we need to give different different looks <clears throat> but that seems to be rather drastic to, to, from a commerce and a business point of view, uh, to just do that without warning and, and when there is no, no uh, intelligence information that there could be a problem there. What is your opinion with respect to that mode? Well, whenever we go to Orange, uh, it's not designed to stop business traffic and traffic at the airport. It's just to add a security measure. So uh, we want to have... But I'm asking you specifically with respect to that tactic. Do you feel that that... Ju that is justified. It, it, it is justified with uh, uh, local airport influence on it. And I don't believe it is designed to be comprehensive where everybody is stopped, but it's a rotating check at different checkpoints as they go in. Uh, and 
uh, some airports have it more comprehensive than others. So there is a specific mandate uh, that we give, but there is some local flexibility on it based upon their own security and the makeup of their airport. I'd be happy to look at that and get you a more specific response. Yeah, I would response. like you to look at that and get back because I, we do get a lot of complaints about that procedure when it, when it occurred on numerous occasions. Could you get back to me on that? Thank you. We'd we'll be happy to. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome, Secretary Hutchison. Um, I, for many years, represented LAX, and I understand uh, on 9-11, LAX was a designation as a target, too. So we've been very concerned about security. Uh, as I was reading through the tons of information that has been prepared for us, uh, do I understand that uh, the U.S. visit program exempts the Canadian border? The exempts Canadians? Uh, anybody who comes across the Canadian border with a visa uh, has, will be treated the same as uh, if they come across the Mexican border with a visa or in our airports. But the fact is that Canadian citizens do not require a visa to come into the United States, so they will not be impacted the same way uh, because they're not visa uh, travelers. What concerns me is you follow the dots. It appears that uh, there's been a lot of activity and uh, a lot of crossing coming from the northwestern part of the United States. And if somebody were part of a conspiracy to do us harm, that would be the route they'd want to come. I just want to mention that. But uh, historically, our country's information system for tracking visitors has really, I would say, been quite uh, a failure. And we've heard again and again in hearings in this committee and in GAO reports how our databases uh, for tracking visitors are full of data that's either outdated or just wrong. And so um, you're planning to add a lot of new information into the existing database. I might have missed it because I did come in late. Uh, so how are we correcting and how are we uh, gathering data that is more updated, more accurate, and uh, considering the requirements uh, of the Privacy Act, what are we doing differently so we will do a more effective job of tracing people who come across our borders and who live among us and uh, who also could do us harm? So the database is where I'm going. Well, uh, first of all, of course, we're consolidating databases, making sure that we share information. but. In reference to people who come across a visa and overstay their visa, uh, and we are doing a great deal to handle that information, uh, not just let it sit there. For example, in U.S. Visit, there is uh, an exit capability now that gives us information on people who do not abide by their visas and leave on time. And that information is referred over from U.S. Visit to uh, our ICE Office of Compliance uh, that will follow up on those leads, and we're beefing up the staffing of that to handle that information. Now, it is a voluminous task. When you're looking at foreign students under the SEVIS program, there's thousands of referrals that come from the universities of students who are not showing up for class, uh, who dropped out, or some other anomaly. We've got to follow up on that. U.S. visit, if someone does not leave within the 30 days through the airport, uh, we can check that, and that information is referred to us. But we've had in, uh, an average of 2,500 uh, potential overstays uh, each week since U.S. visit has been implemented. Now, of those, uh, it might have been someone who left uh, uh, a week later. So it's not a viable lead. They just left maybe four or five days after their 30 days expired. But that's the referral that we have to sort through. And so of the 2,500 per week, only about 20 percent of those might actually be actionable for leads that would be sent to the field. But an enormous amount of work is involved in handling the information that is created. It's a challenge to us, but thank you for raising it because we're working hard on it. Uh, let me just comment by saying when the original bill came through the committee, 
establishing uh, this program, I argued to leave the um, visas and uh, the request for passports and so on to the State Department because the consulars are well trained and I mean they're tough. Out at my embassy, uh, my consular, I mean even people that I thought would be you know safe bets said no because of the training they receive. We don't necessarily have that training and discernment and I was concerned about where we place this particular procedure and so I wasn't clear in listening uh, is there a two-step process when we start looking at the data? Does it go through uh, the U.S. visit program and then to the State Department, the consular section in the state, or does it go to the consular section and then back to U.S. visit? Can you explain that process to me? Well, <laughs> the, uh, I think there's two possibilities here. Uh, one, uh, of course, if a consular office issues a visa, then uh, that happens first, and that information is transferred to Homeland Security so that when they come in through the checkpoint, we will have that same information to confirm their identity. So uh, uh, I think, is that an answer to your question? And then it goes back to the consular section of state? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the second half of that uh, is, of course, if the Department of Homeland Security learns that somebody has overstayed a visa, that information is uh, available to the State Department. So should the person apply for another visa later on, we would be aware of that information and that would have taken place. So it's really mutual. Who, whoever sees them first puts it in the system and this is a system that every day is sharing more and more information together. Uh, the, the most important thing we think is that both consular officers overseas and Homeland Security officers at ports of entry have as much information as is available uh, by either of our agencies to make the best decisions possible. If someone answers my question, but I'm still a little confused. Sure. Um, I think the culprit in all of this is that we just didn't have adequate personnel, enough personnel to stay on these cases. I'm, all of us are so reminded of the aftermath of 9-11 and uh, those hijackers who received their clearance uh, months and months after 9-11 occurred. And so somebody dropped the ball. And I, well, I go ahead. I interrupt yield. you, but I, but I thought your first question, maybe you're going at that, is that uh, in the uh, State Department consular offices when the visa is issued, do our visa security officers duplicate that work? And uh, we're trying to avoid that, obviously, and to complement and give a security perspective. But that might have been the direction of your question. But yeah. I think the, in every area, the information needs to be interchangeable in real time, and that's our objective. Yeah, that's what I understood. And, uh, but I think the consular function should stay with state because they do have experienced workers. And if I could just end by saying, that uh, I know 175,000 persons would be involved when we created the Department of Homeland Security. I hope that uh, we have designated enough people to track this information and keep it updated. That's my concern. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And I want to thank this panel. Uh, we may have some additional questions in writing uh, to follow up on if that would be uh, okay with you, but I'll dismiss this panel. We'll take a two-minute recess as we set up the next. Let me just note for the record that Representative Burton wanted to be here today. He couldn't make it, but um, I want to note that he has testimony for the uh, record, and we'll take a about a two-minute recess.
Thank you. Uh, we're now ready for our second panel, and I want to thank them all for uh, staying with us and taking the time from your busy schedules to appear. Uh, Dr. David uh, Plavin, who is the President of Airports Council International, North America. He is here on behalf of the Airports Council International, North American and American Association of Airport Executives. Randall Johnson, Vice President for Labor, Immigration and Employee Benefits from the U.S. Chamber. And Jessica Vaughn, Senior Policy Analyst for the Center for Immigration Studies. Uh, it's our policy we swear you in. So if you'd rise with me, I'll certify the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. <coughs> we have we have some lights in front of you. When it turns orange, uh, you're on your. Uh, that means four minutes are up, and you have a minute. Uh, your entire testimony is in the record, so it's already part of the record. We've got uh, basically some questions we've already uh, gleaned off that, but if you can try to keep it to five minutes, we'd uh, committee would appreciate it, and we can move right on to questions. But thank you again uh, for being with us and staying with us. Uh, Mr. Plavin, we'll start with you and move straight on down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Thanks for holding this hearing. Uh, today I'm testifying on behalf of uh, ACI North America, uh, ACI Worldwide and the American Association of Airport Executives. We want to start by saying we fully support the goals of the program. Uh, we think it's long overdue. Airports have been arguing for a long time that this is a program that clearly needs to be implemented. And secondly, I want to say that we, we, we really thank the Department of Homeland Security under Secretary Hutchison, um, the, the U.S. visit program, Jim, Jim, Jim Williams and his folks. Uh, the, the individual program has been implemented smoothly and without a lot of disruption. Now, having said all of that, um, I think the other part of the issue is that we need to take great care uh, with the way in which, which, which we implement the program, expand the program, and look at it on an ongoing basis because its potential for damage to the economy is very serious. Let me start with entry, with the entry part of the program. Uh, underlying patterns historically have had the immigration function uh, inadequately staffed at airports. Uh, most of the airports report that, especially during the peak seasons, uh, lines are very long and that, that people are, are waiting a long time and sometimes still waiting on planes in order to get into the arrivals hall. Um, we think U.S. Visit made the right decision in implementing their program in what is traditionally the very slowest part of the travel season. We think that was a great, uh, intelligent decision. But if you put the two together, you can see why we have a concern about the uh, problems that the existing clearance procedures will exacerbate, because New York, for example, reports that fully a third of their people, uh, there are fully a third of their travelers more during the summer season uh, than during the current season. Um, Dulles Airport reports that uh, today they might process 800 to 1,000 U.S. visit um, passengers uh, per day, but at, during the summer months that probably will exceed 2,000 people per day. If we, in fact, extend this program to people who are now covered by the Visa Waiver Program, we're talking about a, a multiplication of that number that's very, very serious and, and we think will overwhelm the CBP and the airport resources. Um, in that context, I think it's very important that we have published standards as to how long we think it ought to take to process people. We don't have that now. In fact, we've moved away from that over the years. And it is not possible for the Department to fulfill the cost effectiveness requirement that you've uh, included in the authorization without having some form of performance standard. There is no acceptance of the fact that there is a reasonable amount of time within which people ought to be cleared coming into the country. There are a series of financial issues. We think that Congress and DHS need to fully fund the U.S. visit program before the exit portion of that is implemented. Our experience with TSA, for example, demonstrates the peril of forging ahead with inadequately conceived and funded solutions. The U.S. visit funding should cover space and services used by the program at the airport. Uh, very important. Let me turn then to the exit elements of the, of the visit program, especially the biometric dimension of it. Uh, it is a much more complicated program to implement than the entry program. Most important, the success of the exit process, that is to say to do what Congress intended it to do, will depend on the proper placement of each process. Uh, especially uh, the needs need to be based on the unique physical and traffic characteristics at each airport, and they are very different. 
that ought to require real and regular consultation with each airport and its airline community. And that's crucial to a successful rollout. That was, was excellent at the beginning of the rollout process. We think it needs to be resumed. Test pilot programs would make that uh, even more effective. It would be critical to test a variety of technologies, uh, kiosks, handheld devices, and placements at airport with different physical and traffic characteristics. The U.S. visit exit phase, unlike the entry phase, will insert an entirely new process, equipment, and staff into airports where previously none existed. Unlike airports in the rest of the world, U.S. airports have not been designed or built to accommodate passenger controls on departures. Passenger flows and passenger mixes are different at each airport. Space is already at a premium at these airports. And now, having said all of this, we think it's really important that in almost every case, we would hope that U.S. visit would focus on, on implementing their program at the departure gates, not in the middle of the concourses where the current experiments have them. We think that's the only way to really be sure that passenger actually goes through the process and actually departs on a flight. It'll also reduce the congestion. And because of the confusion about exit procedures, which will probably continue for a period of time, the conversation we already heard today about the uh, border crossings, uh, we would really hope that as we look at penalties for failure to comply, that we take into account the fact that there are lots of holes in the system that are going to remain that way for a while. Finally, there have been a series of cumulative changes, all of which I think individually have been for the better. But currently what we've got is a hodgepodge layering of security and clearance procedures at airports that undermine efficiency, economic viability, customer service, and security itself in some, kind, some cases. We hope that we can develop that comprehensive approach to all of the DHS programs, including some new facility guidelines on how to put together an airport, how to flow people through it. So finally, Mr. Chairman, again, thank you for holding this uh, hearing. ACI and AAA and our member airports look forward to working closely with you and with DHS uh, to enhance security and travel for the, for the public. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I think my role we, I think we, make sure your button's on there. I think my primary role here today is, is frankly, to, to see that the interests of the border communities in, in this country are represented as, as, the, as the big decisions get here uh, made in Washington. Uh, and in this regard, let me just mention, and in response to some of the questioning earlier, uh, you know, the lessons we have at airports uh, are interesting. And they're important, and, and we certainly share many of the concerns of the prior speaker. But the land ports are an entirely different kettle of fish. I mean, it, it's like comparing, uh, it's like comparing uh, a cruise line on the top of the ocean to the difficulties of exploring the, the depths of the ocean. Uh, I was on the Data Management Information Act Task Force. I was privileged to, to visit many border communities and, and airports. Uh, and it's just not a matter of statistics. You saw those from Asa Hutchinson, where 80 percent of crossings occur almost 400 million a year at the land borders. It's not just a question of statistics and numbers, however. It's a question of environment. Uh, the land borders are entirely different than airports. It's an antiseptic environment versus one where it's dusty, harsh, uh, a lot of stress on border guards. And we can't extrapolate the lessons from one and say that because it's working well at airports, even relatively well, that, that we can take those, those lessons and apply them to the land ports. Uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, I've, I've, our, my testimony is quite lengthy. Uh, I would just like to ask that, that the members of the committee spend some time, if they haven't already, going through the input from all the various local chambers we've had. Uh, I can say that in my experience at the chamber, I've never had such an overwhelming response for information when we did a survey of the chambers so quickly ranging from Laredo to, to Nogales to Ote Mesa to, of course, San Diego. And I think just that response shows the depth of the concern with, with U.S. visit and what may happen come December, uh, frankly, out there in the real world. And I want to emphasize, Mr. Chairman, that, that I'm not here. Yes, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is concerned about profits and cents, but, but when one visits these border communities, it's not just a question of, of, of keeping businesses alive. It's a question of, of, of keeping a way of life alive. It's a question of keeping Americans employed, because when you have slowdowns at the borders and they last more than a few days, Americans lose their jobs. And when Americans lose their jobs, the economy goes downhill. And I remember one, one uh, occasion up in Buffalo where really 
people who were close to having tears in their eyes when they were talking about concerns about delays at the borders and the fact that their children would have to move, schools would close down there could be, because there would be no jobs. So it's not just dollars and cents here. It's environment. It's the social weaving of a community. Uh, let me also mention that there's a natural skepticism among uh, chambers at the borders. Uh, these people have dealt with the government for a long time. Uh, there is a, there's a sense that, well, we're hearing some of these great things, and yeah, it's working well at the airport, so let's, let's roughly apply that to the land ports and see what happens, and we don't think there'll be much of a slowdown, maybe 10 seconds here or there. People just don't believe that that's the way it's going to work out, and, and, and they don't believe Washington is listening to their beliefs, and that's one reason I'm here, but they're asking that Congress, I think, closely follow this process, that DHS, before they implement anything in a massive way, do serious pilot projects to test these concepts so, in fact, there are, there are not any delays at the borders. Now, we're going to be criticized, I know, for, for not being sensitive to national security, but but don't use that argument, I can say, down, down at the people who, who, who live on the borders, who consider themselves U.S. Patri as patriots, as strong as anybody, and they just, wanna, they just wanna have a feeling that the government's listening to them, there's, that there's a conscious sense of what is at stake here, and that, in fact, what the, what the government is implementing will, in fact, promote national security. If they have that, I think everybody, everyone is willing to pull the wagon, but they've gotta have a, a sense of what is the purpose, what is the cost, and is it worthwhile? And DHS needs to do a better idea of, of selling the program. Um, and lastly, just as a technical matter, I should note that, of course, of course, the, the statute that, that, that created the Department of Homeland Security recognizes that economic security, in fact, it's in the mission of the Secretary, economic security is also important to this country and that we have to keep the word is speedy, efficient commerce moving at our borders. That is also part of the Department's mandate as decided by Congress. And, and let me just close by saying, I think we all know that in a political year, uh, there are going to be attacks on this administration based on it's too weak on security, perhaps too strong on security. I don't, I don't know what, it depends which, you know, what, what is the flavor of the day. But there's a concern, I think, at the border communities and generally that, that the department will move too quickly because it will be afraid of these kinds of attacks. And we would just ask that we hope this debate, because the stakes are so high, can, can be accomplished in, in a nonpartisan way. And just closing, we would hope that the Congress carefully follow what the Department does, and if, in fact, deadlines uh, need to be extended, the Congress will seriously consider doing so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Ms. Vaughn, thanks for being here. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for holding this hearing. The U.S. Visit Program is one of the most important and ambitious program enhance, immigration program enhancements ever undertaken. The attacks of September 11th were made possible in part due to failures in our immigration system and specifically our temporary visitor program. Those terrorists, like others before them, obtained visas they were not entitled to, successfully used altered documents, and they overstayed their visas. The fact that U.S. Visit will help prevent the entry of terrorists is not the only reason it's worth doing. When it's fully implemented, U.S. Visit will also help ensure the integrity of, of the non-immigrant visa system as a whole by helping us know that travelers are who we think they are and help ensure that they leave when they're supposed to. It's also important to remember that it can provide a service to legitimate travelers by helping to ensure the safety of international travel and help us understand which visitors pose little risk so that their travel can be facilitated. At the moment, we're operating a massive temporary entry system admitting more than 190 million visitors a year with almost no information on the accuracy of our visa issuance and admissions decisions, virtually no quality control. We do know that today that there are at least 10 million illegal immigrants living in the United States, of whom DS, DHS estimates that at least 30 percent, probably more, are visa overstayers. So we've already made three to four million visa mistakes. Not only do we not know exactly how many overstayers there are, we have very little idea where they came from, how long they've been here, or what kind of visa they entered on. This dearth of information significantly handicaps our visa processing and inspection system. By collecting and analyzing information on departures under U.S. visit, 
immigration and consular officers will have a much better sense of what kinds of applicants are more likely to overstay and which kinds of applicants will be more likely to abide by the terms of their visa. Then we can focus our resources on screening the kinds of applicants who present the most risk and facilitate the processing for the others. In addition to improving our screening of visa applicants, the U.S. Visit Program will also enhance enforcement efforts beyond the port of entry. Interior enforcement is currently the weakest link in our immigration system. A recent GAO report noted that the risk of an overstayer being identified and removed is less than 2 percent. And the data generated by U.S. Visit will provide information on both the problem groups and categories and also generate leads on specific individuals. For the program to have a meaningful impact on enforcement, however, it's necessary that it generate real enforcement activity. In other words, some people need to actually be sent home so that word gets around that overstayers will no longer escape the attention of authorities. As we proceed with the implementation of the program, it's important that the decisions on the order in which different groups are to be phased into enrollment reflect both feasibility and potential benefits to be gained from including them. U.S. visit will turn out to be a huge waste of time and resources if we keep it limited in scope. Right now, by enrolling only non -immigrant, regular non-immigrant visa holders, the program covers only a small fraction of the number of admissions, less than half the number who were covered under the I-94 system, which also included visitors from Mexico and Can certain visitors from Mexico and Canada. Unless U.S. visit begins enrolling more visitors, we actually will be worse off in terms of tracking than we were before. The three main groups missing are visa waiver program visitors, Mexican laser visa holders or the border crossing card people, and Canadians. And all of these categories present their own risks for security and compliance, and therefore all must be included in U.S. visit eventually. I believe the strongest case can be made for enrolling Mexican laser visa holders next. The Southern Land Ports of Entry, Port of Entry system is no, a notoriously loose sieve that is exploited by all kinds of illegal aliens, including terrorists and criminals. Mexicans represent the largest number of illegal aliens in the country, about 70 percent, and probably about one-third of all the overstays. They are one of the most... Uh, today, the, the border crossing cards are being abused with near impunity. They are one of the most frequently counterfeited U.S. documents, and even the genuine documents are used fraudulently. In fact, they are openly available for rent on the street markets of Juarez and other cities. We cannot expect this laxity toward fraud and deceit, that it will be overlooked by terrorists any more than it is overlooked by other prospective illegal immigrants. At somewhere between 5 and 8 million people, the population of laser visa holders is more manageable than either the regular NIV or visa waiver cohorts. And the documents are already biometric and machine readable. This is something we initiated years ago, a considerable effort and expense, but have yet to begin to utilize. Currently, the cards are being swiped very inconsistently, perhaps only half of the time. A large share of pedestrians are checked, but hardly any traveling by car are asked to even show their cards. Of course, we need to implement an exit system as well. But in, in relation to other programs of this kind, again, the scale of the task is manageable. If the state of New Jersey can figure out how to collect money from 30 million people a month, without them having to get out of their car, we should be able to figure out how to swipe out five to eight million people a year without too much imposition. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Schrock, you want to start the question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. It's a, f it's a fascinating subject, and as you may have heard me say earlier, port security. It's a huge issue with me with the Port of Hampton Roads, a major commercial port and the largest naval facilities in the, in the world. So I go across that Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel every weekend thinking who's under there and what are they getting ready to do. Call me paranoid, but uh, if we're not careful, something something could happen. Uh, Mr. Plavin, in uh, in your written st uh, statement, you discussed that the DH for, uh, the need for DHS to involve airports early and intensively in designing the basic building blocks of, of the existing process, because this will be a much greater challenge in the entry process. In your opinion, is DHS making a reasonable effort to discover and incorporate uh, this information into their planning for the exit function? I think uh, DHS has indicated a very good faith in working with us over an extended period of time. My suspicion is that they've discovered that the exit process is much more difficult than anybody had anticipated. That is particularly the question of implementing the biometric capture 
as they actually check the, the departure pieces. And, and part of the problem is what I think a lot of newcomers to the airport business find out is that each airport is different. Is. And each, they're, they're laid out differently. Their traffic patterns, some people are originating at the airport, some are connecting through the airport, some are English speakers, some are not English speakers. And that makes the process of automating the, the, the process of capturing the exit data very much more difficult. So I think um, I, I credit DHS with recognizing that this is a complex issue. And I think the next step in the process is to spend a, a more time from the bottom up working at each airport to try to design that process, which makes the most sense for that particular kind of facility. I was in four or five airports on Monday, and I looked at each one, and he, there are no two that even resemble right. each other. And that has to be, I'm sure that has to be part of the problem. Right. And I went into one, it was like an outdoor garden. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, Augusta. Nice little airport, but my lord, anything could be lobbed into there, pushed into there, sent through a fence, and I think, boy, oh boy, that's a disaster waiting to happen. Mr. Johnson, in your testimony, it, you, you imply that the U.S. visit program should not be implemented at any land border before it's fully tested uh, in a real-world environment. Has the chamber articulated what kind of testing would satisfy this requirement? No, that's a fair question, uh, Congressman. Uh, if, if we can certainly offer that to DHS and work with our local uh, chambers, whether it's Nogales or, or whatever, and, and construct a pilot project like that, I will say that in this regard, because I've seen some recent announcements from DHS concerning testing of, of, of their program, which on its face seemed like good news, the implication was that the testing would be done in existing lanes at some of these borders, i.e., these existing lanes of cross, crossing the border would be taken offline and therefore tested. Well, that's, you know, at the 50th largest land ports at least, that's, that would be a disaster because you're pushing, it, it has to be tested. I know this is, isn't an easy thing to do, but it's got to be tested sort of offline under a realistic, uh, realistic environment, and we would certainly help DHS set that up. How could it be realistic though, if it was offline? I'm not being cynical. I'm just trying to understand in my mind. No, you would, have, you would have to, to, uh, to replicate the same kinds of numbers of people oh, I see. Uh, in various times of the day uh, and then see how, how quickly the, the, the information can be processed, the fingerprints uh, taken, et cetera. I'm not saying it would be cheap, but uh, this, is, this is an expensive process and there's a lot at stake and there's really no room for error. 9-11 wasn't cheap either, uh, right? I'm sorry, sir, what? 9-11 wasn't cheap either. It may cost No, no, it certainly it. wasn't. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Ms. Vaughan, uh, is it your opinion that this, uh, the visit program can have a positive impact on U.S. commercial and travel sectors and what benefits uh, will be gained from a fully functioning visit system? I'm guessing there is not a problem now, but I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. I do think that uh, the business interests have something to gain uh, when we have safe, secure travel that makes an effort to meet the needs of businesses uh, through programs like preclearance, trusted traveler, and so on, as long as we don't compromise security. You know, I think industry, especially the travel industry, for example, has the most to lose That's if right. another attack were ever to occur That's and right. if people begin to perceive that travel is unsafe. Yeah. That was a huge problem after 9-11. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My t time is almost up, so I'll yield. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Rupensberger. Just on the issue that I raised before, from uh, uh, give you the opportunity from the Chamber point of view, uh, our experience at BWI Airport, um, it, it works very well. I think one of the reasons is the cooperation between the uh, Homeland Security and the airport and having the right personnel there, and the personnel are there to help and, and to assist individuals and individuals who don't speak the language. And so far, w there have been no complaints from the airlines or, or, uh, any, or any of the people involved. Um, I would think that is a, is, is, a, is a good program and wondering whether or not the position of the, of, of the chamber would be that to model, to use that as a model to, to move forward. Well, Congressman, I, I think it's, it's we, we have not heard complaints either and in fact, uh, putting exit aside, uh, in which there are serious concerns about when you exit and uh, you, don't, you don't receive a slip of paper that says you exited properly, and then what happens when you come back into the country and you're met by a border guard who said, well, as our records show, you never exited the country and so you're denied entry. Putting that aside, uh, you're right, but, but my point earlier on was that 
the airports are the airports and the land borders are the land borders and they're apples and oranges. And I think it is dangerous to extrapolate too much from the success we've had thus far in a low traffic environment, as Congressman Norton put it, pointed out, and say, well, this seems to be working well at BWI, so let's do it at Nogales or Douglas, Arizona, or Ote Mesa. Uh, it's just, there are, they are worlds apart. And, and I think um, to the extent that, Mr. Mr. Chairman, this committee, this, this committee could hold a field hearing at some of the border towns uh, and visit with some of these people who deal with these realities, it would be, it would be very, very helpful. Yeah, they're not denying, um, re they're not denying on reentry, just, just uh, dealing, dealing with the issue as far as reentry is concerned. But I would think that even the people coming to the United States of America for business or for whatever reason would want to, to, to have a safe environment. And, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an extremely important issue to, to what we're dealing with. And the use of, of air, if, if in fact we have another, another terrorist attack using airplanes, I don't know what it would do to the airline industry. Well, I agree, Congressman. And let me clarify, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce supported the, cre the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we key voted the legislation in the House and the Senate. Uh, but there, but there are, there is a need also to keep commerce moving in this country, and we need to try and seek, seek a balance. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it is a mandate in the Department of Homeland Security's mission statement that it protect the, the national security of this country and the economic security. So the department is charged Good with question. looking at all these factors and, and trying to, in its wisdom, balancing them. Like most programs in management, it starts at the top. And, and if you're holding people accountable for their performance, you, you evaluate the issue and you, you provide the proper resources, which includes personnel, the program usually works. Right. Resources is a huge question here. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Chairman, if I may. You may. Go ahead. I think I'd, I'd like to add something as well. The, the issue about the success of the program at BWI should, should I think, be understood in context. The uh, program has been implemented on the entry side at about 115 airports and uh, seaports. Um, it's the only place where we've actually begun an experiment with how to capture data biometrically on the exit, exit process. Side, right. And unfortunately, part of the process is we really have no way of knowing how much of the exit process we're capturing because of where, in fact, that capture is being placed. We don't know how many people are missing it. We don't know how many people are departing without checking in with it. And so our, our point to it is it may not be interfering with process. It may not be interfering with how people move through the system, but we really don't have any way of, of knowing whether, in fact, it is being effective in doing what it's designed to do. Are you familiar with the helper program that's being used there? Yes, I am. And I think that What's that's your opinion an, of that program? It's an excellent program, and I think it has worked well to help people who are baffled by it. But, uh, but what we, again, what we don't know is how many people aren't really taking advantage of that process and, in fact, registering that they have left the country, a concern that we have is that if we don't know the answer to that, then we won't know when people try to re-enter whether they're legitimate re-entries or whether they've actually violated their visa in a prior, in a prior stay. Right. Okay. That's what I was trying to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Playman, let me start. Uh, in your testimony, you note that DHS uh, should plan to add significant numbers of staff uh, at airports during peak travel periods in order to avoid long lines and overcrowding facilities uh, for all uh, arriving travelers. Could you expand on this? And, do you have any stats that would back this up at this point? You heard the testimony previously to this in terms of their expectation. Obviously, yeah. it's a concern to the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, the history of this goes back a long way, and it goes back way before 9-11 and way before the creation of the department. Um, for many, many years, uh, large points of ports of entry, airport ports of entry, have experienced uh, many times during the peak season when their arrivals halls are, are so overflowing that you've had to keep all passengers on arriving aircraft since there was no room for them in the arrivals hall. We've now added by um, the um, U.S. visit estimate something like 10 or 15 seconds to each transaction uh, on an arriving passenger in order to capture their fingerprint and their, um, their uh, facial recognition profile. Um, you add that to the fact that we're talking about big arrivals halls processing maybe four or 5,000 passengers an hour um, today, sometimes with success, sometimes without success, so that, that our sense is for two reasons. One is to be sure that the entry process is properly staffed and also that we're not making it worse by the addition of the, of the, um, the, the biometric capture. Uh, we need the additional people to be sure that we're not making the wait so long that we're discouraging people from coming to the country.
In your, uh, Mr. Johnson, in your test written testimony, you focus uh, a great deal on the potential damage that can result from improper implementation of the U.S. visit program. Uh, it is clear that the U.S. border as it functions today is neither effective to secure the nation or promote free movement. People sit in their car and they wait in line for a long time. Further, visitors overstay their visas with little or no concern that the government will ever take notice of their violation. Uh, this is why DHS was created in the first place. Uh, do you think that DHS, even in its first year, has been an improvement over the mix of agencies that had jurisdictions over the borders in the past? Do you have any opinion on that? Yes, obviously there is there is there's, there's, there's that syndrome of, of trying to create a new system while while reorganizing the old one. Uh, and but I think there were, as you well know, there are many many complaints about INS uh, prior to the creation of DHS. Uh, it's hard to quantify it. I would say there ha there have been some improvements in that area. Um, there's at least. I think we have a better, considering the, the, the panoply of agencies that were, were absorbed, we have, I think, a more definite number of people we know who to go to to talk to, uh, to, to try and make our views known. And there are some startup issues, but, but overall I think that it has been an improvement, but there is a long ways to go. I will say that DHS uh, has, has ramped up its, its, I think, its outreach efforts to the business community and I'm sure others. Uh, which has been uh, very helpful to us, of course. Okay. Um, Ms. Vaughn, um, in your written testimony, you note that at the current time we are operating a massive temporary entry system admitting almost 190 million temporary visitors a year with almost no information as to the soundness of our visa issuance and admissions decision. Do you see DHS moving in the right uh, direction in their attempt to uh, balance the needs of security and commerce? I do. Uh, I think. I was actually thrilled to hear that DHS has started to implement the arrival departure information system, for example, which is a way of capturing the exit information for a lot of the travelers without having to go biometric yet or having to figure out how to install a scanner for travelers leaving at every airport and every departure situation so that we are at least capturing some information and can start to learn which kinds of travelers are the problems and indeed what the scale of the problem truly is. We haven't had um, any kind of report on overstays other than a guess at the total number of overstays in, in more than 10 years. And so now at least we can start to work with real information to try to, to impose some quality control on our decisions. And I think that not only helps us get a, a grip on the overstay problem and enforcement, but also benefits legitimate travelers because then we aren't wasting time uh, scrutinizing people who, who may not need to be scrutinized so closely. You also state in your recent, uh, written testimony uh, that at this time the U.S. visit program does not intend to include Mexican uh, laser visa holders. Of course, since 2001, all border crossing cards have included biometric features. In your opinion, uh, could these cards be adopted to serve the identification and um, authentication functions of U.S. visit at the southern border? Yes, it's, it's hard for me to understand why they haven't been yeah. yet. Um, part of the problem is that not every port of entry has a scanner to read the cards. But uh, as I said, we know that there is a serious problem in misuse of the cards. And even a small scale program to try to begin to get a handle on how the, car, how the cards are being used indicates that there is a problem. I mean, we, saw the, we know that there we are not sure exactly how many cards exist, but it is some, somewhere between 4 and 8 million, we think. Uh, and yet, uh, from the information provided today from DHS, there is something like 104 million crossings with those cards, which, if you do the math, tells you that you know, somebody, every person is crossing every couple days on one of these cards which leads you to believe that there may be some misuse of them or every single person who has one is coming up a lot <laughs> and either doing quite a lot of business or perhaps working or perhaps lending it to someone else. Good. Thank you very much. Mr. Trump. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wasn't going to ask any questions, but based on some of the directions your questions were going and Dutch Ruppersberger's comment on uh, BWI, uh, in your written statement, uh, Mr. Plavin, you said, you say, and I'm quoting, that you strongly urge U.S. visit to design its exit procedures to be conducted at the airport departure gates. Um, in the preliminary test at BWI, the exit kiosks, I think, were placed at the 
TSA screening uh, sites. Why wouldn't that be appropriate for other, other airports as well? Uh, I think that my understanding of the BWI process is it's actually a little bit beyond the security gate, actually in the middle of the concourse. Um, and I have, I think there are two reasons. Number one, if it's actually integrated into the passenger screening process, uh, it adds significant amount of time to the line for everyone on the line. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why I think the, um, the, the CB people decided to push it back away from the security piece. But in doing so, either, way, either one of those alternatives doesn't allow you to capture people who are actually arriving at the airport on a connecting flight. What kind of grief is it causing the TSA people at BWI? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What kind of grief is it causing the people at the, the, the TSA I, I don't think at, in the way it was implemented at BWI, I don't un, my understanding is that it hasn't really caused TSA very much grief because it's sufficiently far away from the okay. security checkpoint okay. that it doesn't represent an interference. And, and CBP has added, or uh, U.S. Visit has added um, some people to assist people in the use of the kiosk that they've so put in the So when you say place near the TSA screen site, it could be 50, 60, 100 uh, feet away? Yeah, somewhere okay. with, within I 50, see. 60 okay. yards. Not right there with yeah. that complex. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I want to thank our panel. Let me just note, this is, will be the largest procurement this new department has put together. Uh, there's a very high expectation on it. We've stayed away from the intricacies of the procurement itself. Uh, but I want to make it clear we're going to continue to look very carefully at this as it moves through the process. Uh, your comments have been very helpful to that end, and we appreciate very much all of you taking the time to appear with us today. Um, I want to uh, keep the record uh, open for a week to allow witnesses to include any other information that may occur to you on the record, and the hearing's adjourned. Thank you. Coming up on C-SPAN, a look at U.S. efforts abroad to combat HIV and AIDS. And at 7 a.m. Eastern, Washington Journal.